Jesus told us, seek first the kingdom of God uh, and his righteousness, which encompasses every aspect of human life. And so we need to be thinking through how, how does our Christian faith uh, influence the way that we think about uh, human cloning or the use of technology or uh, the, the way that we uh, interact with one another in our churches or immigration reform or abortion issues and so forth. Uh, and then also to speak to the larger culture to say this is what Christians are concerned about and particularly when it comes to issues of religious liberty, why we believe that freedom of conscience is so important not only for ourselves but for everyone, uh, that everyone should be able uh, to freely uh, live and believe and practice a religion. We're going to have sharp disagreements often uh, in the public square, but I think we can do that with a sense of, of kindness in the way that uh, Jesus himself uh, modeled uh, someone who certainly was not holding anything back uh, in his public ministry, but did so with a love for people, listening to people. I think that's critically important. What both sides of the so-called culture wars need is a sense of empathy uh, for not only what does the other side hold, but why does the other side hold that. And so I think if we realize that the people who disagree with us aren't cartoon supervillains sitting back in a lair somewhere plotting to destroy civilization, uh, they're, they're people created in the image of God who have strongly held beliefs uh, because of, of reasons, other, other beliefs that they hold. If we understand those things, then I think we'll be able to speak to people and not simply about people. And so that doesn't mean that we're going to be able to persuade one another on everything, but it does mean that we can have some, some civil conversations that might yield some fruit in the long term. And one of the problems I think that we have is that we want to have immediate solutions uh, to our problems. And so we have a debate. If the debate isn't settled right then, uh, then we, we simply move on. Sometimes I think it takes ongoing conversation uh, over a long period of time. And I think we need to train our people in our churches to be able to do that. Because most of the conversations uh, that people in our communities are having with their neighbors are not Fox News, MSNBC style debates that are over within 20 minutes. They're long-term conversations in the line at the grocery store, or sitting in the Starbucks uh, over things that matter that sometimes go on for months or years. And I, I think that's what we need to model. When you think of issues ranging from the uh, health and human services contraceptive mandate to those questions about uh, how, how much should the government impinge on, on conscience, uh, all the way over to questions about uh, should we zone mosques out of local communities or, uh, or religious liberty threats around the world? Uh, questions of uh, banning circumcision in Germany, uh, for instance, uh, Middle East blasphemy laws. Those concerns are always going to be uh, at the forefront. And then I think questions of human dignity, uh, which range not only from uh, questions of abortion and the right to life, uh, but also questions of uh, human cloning, uh, in vitro fertilization, uh, questions of how we treat uh, immigrants among us, uh, not only in terms of policy, but also in terms of, of tone and the way that we speak uh, about those who are, as the Bible puts it, sojourning among us. I think those questions are going to be very, very relevant in the days to come. The Bible tells us to care for the sojourner in the land, and so we're, we're to see ourselves as people who, in, in the biblical story, were sojourners in a strange land in Egypt uh, and, and were, and were uh, delivered from that. And so we're to have a sense of compassion uh, for those who are living among us, who are in a, in a strange land for, them, for themselves and for their families. And so I think we, we ought not to see uh, immigrants as, as, as some people would put it, parasites or those who are draining our resources. We ought to see immigrants as those who are seeking a better life for their families uh, and who are, are doing the best they can in order to get that better life for their family. So there ought to be a sense of compassion there and a sense of, of doing justice uh, toward those immigrants. We have a commitment to the family and to the dignity of the person. We also have a value when it comes to uh, the rule of law. And so no one is calling for open borders with no border regulation. No one is calling for that, or very few people are calling for that. And no one is calling for deporting 11, 12, 14 million people, or very few people are calling for that. It's not a very realistic solution. So instead we have to say, what's the best way uh, to deal justly with immigrant communities who are already here, but who are living in uh, lives that are in many ways invisible, which is 
harmful to the rule of law. It's also harmful to immigrant families themselves uh, in terms of, in all sorts of ways. And so finding a just way to move uh, immigrant families and communities into the mainstream of American society is a Christian, uh, is, a, is a deeply held Christian uh, notion. Culture changes the way that we view reality, sometimes in ways that we don't see and that we don't perceive, sometimes in good ways and sometimes in bad ways. Uh, I think about uh, Sesame Street. Uh, when I was a, a kid growing up in the late 70s and early 80s, Sesame Street was significantly uh, shaping in a good way uh, for our generation because Sesame Street wasn't contextualizing to the way things were. They were contextualizing to the future. So you had a neighborhood uh, made up of white people and African-American people and Latino people who were all getting along and existing in the same neighborhood in a way that, that sometimes children in the United States at that time had never seen. They were separated from one another in a way that I think had good effects uh, on cultures throughout, uh, throughout the United States. Culture can work in that way. Culture can also work in a destructive way, in ways in which we don't see what's happening to us, why we, why we are driven by an advertising culture, uh, for instance, to want more and more and more of things we don't need. If we don't see that and we don't recognize that, then we're going to be shaped in a way that the Bible says is, is being conformed to the pattern of this world rather than through the renewing of the mind. And so having an attentive view of culture, I think, is a very a biblical thing to do which doesn't just mean raging against the culture. Uh, it means instead seeing where are God's good gifts showing up in culture, where are things that we ought to be wary of within the culture, and having a discerning mind and a discerning eye, which means listening uh, for what kinds of things are being said in music, in art, in film, in, in other ways, and diagnosing those. Um, again, not, not in some sort of um, Manichaean good versus evil way, but how are people made in the image of God reflecting that image? And how are we as fallen sinners reflecting that in the things we sing about, in the things that we make movies about, in the things that we write poetry about? I think that's important uh, for Christians. And you see that in the, in the Bible. The Apostle Paul is at Mars Hill and he starts quoting back poetry, uh, pagan poetry, uh, to the people that he's talking to to say, look, even you understand what I'm talking about. You, you don't really believe the things that you're telling me because I've listened to your, to, to your music. And so I think loving neighbor and understanding neighbor means listening to a wide variety of what's being said in culture to be able to have a sense of empathy and also a sense of mission uh, toward that. As a Christian, uh, scripture speaks of my relationship to God as one that happens through adoption. You have received adoption as children, uh, the scripture says. And so when we are caring for the orphan and, and welcoming uh, the, the stranger into families, what we're doing is modeling and imaging what has happened in the gospel in our own lives. And so the adoption culture that is stirring in our churches right now is reminding us of the gospel and the gospel that we believe is stirring us to care for our neighbor, including the orphan and the widow, which is, of course, an old, old, ancient uh, Christian mandate, care for the widow and the orphan in, uh, in distress. And so I, I think we're recovering that in some really healthy ways. As much as I call people to adopt, I also call people not to adopt. The only thing worse than someone that God has called to adopt a child, not adopting a child, is someone who is not equipped to adopt a child, adopting a child. And so not everybody within the church is called to adopt children, not at all. Uh, but there are all sorts of ways that we can care for orphans. Uh, some people God has called to adopt. Some people God has called to encourage others uh, who are adopting or fostering. Uh, some people God is calling to um, serve in, in mission activities in their own communities or around the world, ministering to women or to children who can't be adopted but who need the presence of Christ. And anybody who thinks that adoption is easy or that foster care system is easy, this is something that's simply going to be a, a sentimental, gauzy uh, sort of moment, shouldn't be adopting. To say that evangelicals are adopting children in order to evangelize them is no more realistic than saying that evangelicals are getting married and having babies in order to evangelize those children. 
Of course, evangelical Christians believe in raising our children uh, in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, as the Bible puts it. Buddhist families raise their children uh, with Buddhist values. Secular progressive families raise their children with secular progressive values. Of course, the things we believe are important, we teach to our children. But the children aren't a means to an end. We love our children and we seek to uh, do what's best for our children. So it's not a, it's not a subversive backdoor to evangelism. Christians love children and we see children who need families. Bible tells us that, uh, that it is good for children to be raised in families, and so we, we answer that call. There have been Christians who have tried to take a political party platform, one or the other, and, and simply adding Bible verses to it. And so I remember seeing uh, a, a Christian voting guide several years ago that had a Christian position on gun control and a Christian position on a line item veto and on the balanced budget amendment in a way that I think really breeds cynicism because we understand and know the Bible doesn't give us a road map uh, for every uh, issue. The Bible gives us um, a goal. The uh, Bible gives us a sense of what human flourishing ought to look like. And sometimes there are going to be issues where the Bible speaks very clearly uh, to us and we have to speak just as clearly. Other issues where we realize we may have the same goal, but we have different ways of getting to that goal. So two Christians, for instance, might disagree on what the minimum wage ought to be. Um, these aren't necessarily two Christians, one of whom is supporting the Bible's message about helping the poor, another of whom is rejecting it, but instead two people who are saying, what's the best way to help the poor? So the, the person who says, I, I really don't want to raise the minimum wage too high because I'm afraid it will create unemployment, and the other who says, it's not going to create unemployment, we need to help, help those who are raising families, these are not a, a question of, this isn't a question of good versus evil, it's a question of two people with a good goal who are trying to find the most prudential way to get there. And so I, th I think obviously there are some issues that as a Christian we would have to say this is, this is off the table. Someone who uh, wants to use nuclear weapons on Canada uh, just simply because he can is obviously outside of uh, the biblical message and ought to be spoken of in that way. But then there are a whole range of issues where we can agree to disagree. And I think that has to be important with Christian witness, not only knowing what to speak to and not shrinking back from that, but also knowing when not to speak or when to speak in a way that simply frames the debate uh, and, and helps to see the goal in mind without speaking to the specifics. I think that, that happens, for instance, on questions of environmental protection sometimes. I have a great uh, burden for stewardship of the creation and of natural resources. But sometimes you're going to have Christians who are going to disagree on, for instance, cap and trade. Will cap and trade actually uh, help uh, steward the environment or will it simply move polluters to China and to India? Well, that's a, that's a real debate that Christians of goodwill can have with one another as we seek to come to a prudential answer for that. Not one group of people who are with Jesus in the Bible and another group of people who are not.